the green I was telling you about. Okay, so we're going to start with some vocabulary. Capital is money, specifically money involved in business. So it's money used to start or expand in a business. Okay, a sole proprietorship is a business owned by one person only. Okay, um, so if, you know, some guy owns a, a food truck and he's, he, it's his food truck, he owns it, that's his business, it's a sole proprietorship. If somebody like rents a food truck from another company, that's not a sole proprietorship, right? Okay, um, profit is money left over after the bills are paid. Okay, so profit is kind of like the business's paycheck. So after all the bills are paid, all the expenses are paid, whatever's left is your profit. Okay. Personally liable. If you have a uh, proprietorship, a sole proprietorship, or a partnership, which we'll talk about in a second, people that own businesses, especially sole proprietors, are personally liable, which means that the, the owner is responsible for any losses or debt of the business. Okay, so let's talk about food, like, okay, food truck. Let's say I, I started, um, you know, like, my own food truck business and I call it, you know, Cafe A Go Go, because I can go, right? And that's the name of my business, but I own it. I'm the sole proprietor. And I rent the truck, or I don't rent the truck, I finance the truck. And I finance <coughs> food equipment and I finance all this stuff, but I go under. The business goes under. I can't turn around and be like, well, the business closed, sorry. You don't get your money because it's not the business that's responsible. It's the owner that's responsible. So if that happens and I go into a bunch of debt to open a business and the business fails, I'm still having to pay the debt. So you're per personally liable. Okay, a partnership occurs when two or more people own a business. <coughs> Now when we talk about personal liability, if you have a partnership, all of the partners are liable. And it may be not equally liable because maybe one person owns more of the business than the other, they put more money in to start, but they're still both liable. Okay, a corporation is a little different. If you incorporate, depending on how you set up your articles of incorporation, corporations are a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> They're um, a little harder to start. They're more expensive to start as far as getting the licensing and things. But with a corporation, you don't have personal liability. There is still some liability, but it's not personal liability, the way if you have a sole proprietorship. So if your sole proprietorship goes out of business and you owed like $50,000, you personally now owe $50,000. Whereas if corporation goes out of business, that's not exactly the case. Um, corporations 
create shares of stock. And stocks are certificates. that indicate ownership. So if you buy a share of stock in, let's say, Microsoft, even if you only buy one share of stock, you are part owner of Microsoft now. We always think of Bill Gates. When you talk Microsoft, Bill Gates. Bill Gates does not actually own Microsoft. He was the CEO of Microsoft. He was the creator. He, you know, he started it, but he, ne he did not own it. He may have owned a large portion of it because of stocks and things, but every single person that owns a share of that stock owns Microsoft. Are the uh, owners of a corporation? And these are the people that bought the stock. Okay, and the percentage of stock you own is the percentage of the business that you own. Okay, limited liability, okay. With a corporation, you are limited in your liability. You are only responsible okay. You only lose however many shares of stocks you own. Okay, so let's say you've purchased 50 shares of some company and the shares were $10 each. So you spent 500 bucks and that corporation goes out of business, you only lose that 500 bucks. Now granted, losing 500 bucks is awful, but if it's a big corporation that's in a lot of debt, losing only that $500 is a lot better than if they were able to come after all the individual stockholders for that debt, which they're not allowed to do. You can only lose the value of your stock. So if you create a corporation and you set it up properly, if that corporation goes out from out of business, you are not personally liable for the debt. The corporation is liable for the debt. And a public corporation, there are public and private corporations. So like you could open a business tomorrow and register it as a corporation and you would be the, you could say I own all the stock and nobody else can buy stock. It's not being traded. Or you could give it to somebody. You could like give it as a gift to somebody like here, here's 20 shares of stock in my business. Merry Christmas. Um, but that has to be it. It's a gift. It's private. You know, it's either you give it to somebody or you just own it yourself. A public corporation is anybody can buy this, anyone can buy the stock. Okay, and you may have heard on the news at some point, like so-and-so company is going public. It's a big deal when a company goes public like that. Usually it means that they've gotten really big and they need a lot more income, so they put up sh their stock for sale to anyone, and then they get more income. Um, and there are a lot of regulations and rules and processes that you have to go through to become public from being private. But don't you have to show like all the, uh, <coughs> like all the stuff, that, like all the Okay, so if you're, if you're a business, if you're a partnership, if you're a corporation, and more than one person owns you, they don't own equal portions. If I went out today and I bought one single share of Apple, I obviously do not own the same amount of that company as somebody that has bought 15,000 shares of Apple or somebody that's bought a million shares of Apple. We don't have the same ownership rights. We don't have the same power. 
makes sense, right? You wouldn't want, like, if you went out and spent all the money to own, like, 20% of Apple, you wouldn't want me with my little one share going, I get to make decisions too. <laughs> I spent $100, right? Okay, so if we have a, a partnership that has four partners, and the total of all the investments is $240,000. And Michelle invested $15,000. We want to know what is her percent of the business. Okay. So we're going to take that $15,000. And we're going to divide it by $24,000. And that's going to give us a decimal. Really? And what I'm going to do to make my division easier, I'm going to knock off some of these zeros. So I'm going to have 15 divided by 240. Okay, that gives me 0 0.0625. I'm going to move two places to the right to convert that to a percent. Okay, and so Michelle would own six. 0.25% of the business. Now, depending on how many people went into the company together, that could be close to equal, or that could be a really small part. You know, it just depends on how many people, how many partners there are. Oh, wait, four other partners. Okay, and that's small, right? And to do the percent, you do part divided by whole. Gives you percent. All right, uh, we have, there are 650,000 shares of Bulls Corporation stock, and Mike owns 12%, and we want to know how many shares is that? Well, first we're going to take this 12%, and we're going to convert it to a decimal. So I'm going to move <coughs> two spaces to the left. of indicates multiplication. So I'm going to multiply 0 0.12 times 650,000. And that's 78,000 shares. Okay, now this is one way to do it. Like this is method one. Um, there's a second way to do this. You can set up a proportion. 12% is the same thing as 12 over 100, and that's equal to X over 650,000. So if you cross multiply, you get 100. X is equal to 7,800,000. And then you divide by 100, and you get the same answer. Up to you. Two different methods, same problem, same result. Okay, so three partners are investing $900,000 to open a garden and landscaping store. If their investments are in the ratios of two, three, and five, we want to know how much, that's a D, does, sorry, does the partner that invested the least contribute? Okay. Well, we take this ratio, and we set that up using the variable x. Okay, and it doesn't matter what numbers these are. These could be any numbers at all. You just keep the same numbers and put x's on them. Okay, and if I add those all together, that represents the total amount of the investment. Okay, so X would be $90,000 if nobody invested X, right, because there's no one. So the smallest one, the least amount invested is 2X. So 
So the person that invested the least still put up 180000 Well, stock market. You hear stock market all the time. What does that mean? It just means an institution through which stocks are bought and sold. So... Now, the main ones, those are right here. The New York Stock Exchange, which is the NYSE and the NASDAQ. You guys have probably heard NASDAQ mentioned on television before too. It's the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. These are the most common ones, but there are other, there's like, other countries have their own stock markets and stock exchanges. There's other ones in this country. So these are just the two most prominent stock exchanges. Okay, um, a trade is a stock market transaction. So if you buy or sell stocks, it's called trading. You're not really trading. You kind of are. Um, once you've put in that initial investment, when you buy your very first shares of stocks. Then you have to put out money out of your bank account, right? Now if you continue just buying stock, you have to keep putting money up out of your bank account. But once you get to a certain point where you're buying and selling, like the money that you would get from selling the stock and you're using that to buy other stock, you never actually, money never actually exchanges your hands. It's like kind of almost make-believe money and you're just trading stocks. Does that make sense? So I think that's why they call them trades. Okay, and then like I said, these two are the, um, the two most well-known stock markets. Okay, last. <clears throat> last and close are two different numbers, and that seems kind of weird, but there's last and close. Last is the, la the price per share of the last trade. So they don't mean last as in the last one in the day. They mean last as in the last one that just happened two seconds or five minutes ago. Okay, so the last changes all the time, right? Because stock prices fluctuate by pennies and dollars constantly. They're just constantly fluctuating. So if I'm buying a share of stock now, I would look at what it last sold at or last bought for. Okay. Close, also known as the closing price, this is the last price Okay, so if you look at like the New York Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange closes at 4 p.m. The closing price would be whatever that last price was at, you know, like pretty much right at 4 o'clock. Okay, um, the high is the highest price in that day. I mean, that makes sense, right? And then the low, of course, is the lowest price. Okay. 
Volume is the number of shares traded in a given time period. So that might be one day, it might be one hour, it might be a week, a month. It's just a set time period and you look at how many shares were bought or sold. Um, sometimes volume is listed as sales in the hundreds. Okay, when that happens, it's not talking about individual numbers, it's talking about groups of 100. which kind of makes sense, right? Sales of 100. So if you have 50 of those, you had 50 groups of 100, so that's uh, 5,000 shares. They have a 52-week high and the 52-week low. 52 weeks is a year, right? So this is the highest value in the last year. And this is the lowest value over the last year. Okay. Um, this is change, C H G change. It's also known as the net change. Okay. That is the change between the previous day's close and the current day's close, okay? So, well done. Okay, um, so this is a percent or a dollar amount, depending on how it's being reported. Sometimes they might say, you know, the net change was 22%, or 22%, it's never that high, like 3%, or like, you know, $10 or something. Um, and it can be positive or negative, right? So if today closed at, closes, it's not closed yet, but if today closes at more money than yesterday, we'd have a positive change. If it closes at less money today, we have a negative change. Okay. Um, after hour trading, this used to almost never happen. Um, now, granted, you could call your stockbroker after, after the market closes, because the market closes at four, but let's say your stockbroker's open until five. So you call your stockbroker up and be like, hey, I want to buy, you know, I want to sell my <coughs> shares in pork rinds and I want to go with corn or whatever, right? And they, like, make little notes in their thing and, like, the next morning they would actually do it. Of course, now we have lots of technology. So after our trading happens all the time now. Whereas before, that wasn't really possible. Now with computers, I mean, I could go on my computer at home and I don't need a stockbroker. I mean, they're nice because they know the market and they can advise you and everything, but you don't really need one. You can go just barrel in and do it yourself. So now with all the computers, after hour trading happens more often, and these are trades made after the market closes. Um, how do you know if after hour trading has gone on? Okay, today's Monday, right? So at some point we're going to close. Monday's going to close. And let's say uh, my closing for today is $5, whatever stock I'm talking about. And then tomorrow op morning it opens at 523. If there's a difference between today's closing and tomorrow's opening, that's how you know after hours trading went on. Otherwise, if there's no after hours trading, they should be exactly the same. Because it's trades that change the price of the stock. 
Oh, you know, and weather and the farm report and a whole bunch of other stuff, but mostly it's trades. If we look on May 12th, it says, what is the actual volume of XYZ shares posted? Well, it gave us the sales in the hundreds as 32,000, right? But that's sales in the hundreds. So we have to multiply that by 100. So it's actually 3,200,000 shares. <coughs> okay. And now if we want to write that volume in the thousands, we divide that by a thousand. And you get 3,200,000. Okay. We want to know at what price did XYZ Corporation close on May 4th. Now remember how I said it opened at 5010, but it closed at 5220 on May 5th, but the change was 261. That means that the opening from May 5th and the close from May 4th was not the same, right? So we take the we take the close from May 5th. So we take the 5220. That's the close from May 5th. And we subtract the change. And we get 49.59. So when you take that, if you take the close from one day and you take the change from that day, you can find out the close from the previous day and you can see there were overnight trades or after hour trades. Okay. And now if I take the May closing price and the May opening price, I can find the distance in prices or the difference in prices as a percent. Okay, so how do I do this? I take that opening price and I subtract the closing price. And I divide it by the <coughs> closing price. Because it's positive, it was an increase. So, um, you do new minus old divided by old. Okay. If you get a positive not answer, it was an increase. If you get a negative answer, it was a decrease. But that's the formula to find percent increases or decreases. So it's new minus old divided by old. This sheet is an electronic worksheet that can be used to keep track of things. In this case, stock info. 
And in case you're wondering, that's like Excel. EX. How do you spell Excel? EXCEL. Okay. Right, you guys have all seen Microsoft Excel. So that's a spreadsheet program. Okay, a cell is an intersection of a row and column. So it's a single block. Okay, and they're named column row. So if I take this amount right here, this is called cell D4, right? Because it's in column D and row four. So they're column the name. Okay. Now here I have my change. This was my change between my close today and my close before. So if I did this, this is actually D5 minus D4. Oh, that's a 4. Okay, right, because I take this number and I subtract that number. And I can enter that. If I entered that right here, what I would actually write, this is what I would actually write. I'd write equals D5 minus D4. <coughs> to calculate the percent of net change for May 6th. Now, if you remember, our net change was... May 6th minus May 5th divided by May 5th, right? Okay. So May 6th close, that's D6. And May 5th close is D5. I'm going to divide that by D5. Now to turn that into a percent, you end up multiplying by 100. That's how you, we, we move the decimal two places, but what you're really doing is multiplying by 100. Now I cannot enter this into Excel this way. Okay, so we need to convert. Okay. Now here's what we do, we need to use our order of operations. So we need to put things in parentheses that have to be subtracted first. Then we can divide. And then multiplying is the little asterisk. You know, um, shift 8. And then we'll multiply by 100. And then you have to always put the equal sign in front of it. If you don't put the equal sign in front of it, it won't actually do the calculation. It would actually show this in the cell, just like you typed it. 